This is Barry Zalma speaking for Claim School Incorporated's blog, Zalma on Insurance. Today we're going to talk about first party property fraud and how it is necessary to complete a thorough investigation of a suspected fraud. Every first party property adjuster and SIU investigator will face in his or her career attempts to defraud the insurer for whom the adjuster or SIU investigator works. It is necessary that they are aware of each type of property insurance fraud he or she may encounter. Some, but surely not all, fraud types follow. Arson for Profit Arson is the intentional burning of property. It no longer is limited to specific types of property. Although perhaps the most dangerous of all methods of insurance fraud, people continue to attempt insurance fraud by burning their homes, vehicles, and business structures. The FBI, in fact, advises that even back in 2010, 15,475 law enforcement agencies provided 1 to 12 months of arson data that reported 56,825 arsons in the United States. Of the participating agencies, 14,747 provided expanded offense data regarding 48,619 arsons. Arsons involving structures, that is, residential, storage, public, etc., accounted for 45.5% of the total number of arson offenses. Mobile property was involved in 26% of arsons, and other types of property, such as crops, timber, fences, etc., accounted for 28.5% of reported arson fires. The average dollar loss due to arson was $17,612. Arsons of industrial manufacturing structures resulted in the highest average dollar losses, an average of $133,717 per arson. Arson offenses decreased 7.6% in 2010 when compared with arson data reported in 2009. Nationwide, there were 19.6 arson offenses for every 100,000 inhabitants. By use of technical devices, chemical analysis, and even trained dogs, it has become more difficult for the arsonist to cause a fire that appears to a trained investigator to be accidental. Arson is not excluded in any first-party fire policy. It is, in fact, a specifically covered peril. Fire! There is no arson defense available to an insurer. The defense for an arson caused by an insured to defraud an insurer is the misrepresentation, concealment, or fraud exclusion that exists in every fire insurance policy. If an insured sets fire to his furniture or car to defraud the insurer, the defense available to the insurer is fraud, not arson. To defend a claim based upon fraud by arson, the insurer must prove the following. 1. The property was insured under a contract of insurance. 2. The contract of insurance contained a provision allowing the insurer to void insurance because of misrepresentation, concealment, false swearing, or fraud. 3. An exclusion for intentional acts of the insured similar to that in the New York Standard Fire Policy. 4. The fire was not accidental. 5. The fire was caused by the acts of a person or persons. 6. The fire was set by the insured or someone acting for the insured. and 7. The fire was set for the purpose of defrauding the insurer. Under Michigan law, for example, 
In order to establish an arson defense, the insurer need only show that the fire was of incendiary origin and that the insured had both motive and opportunity to set it. Each element, of course, may be established and usually can only be established by circumstantial evidence. There is rarely direct evidence that a fire was set by an insured. Without an eyewitness or other direct evidence, the insurer can only prove that the insured was involved in an arson for profit circumstantially by presenting evidence of the insured's motive, opportunity, and ability to cause the fire. Motive is not required to prove arson, although showing a trier of fact a motive makes it easier for the trier of fact to believe that the insured caused the fire to occur to defraud the insurer. For example, showing an insured's financial difficulties or anger at a spouse or significant other can establish motive. Also, an insured who has access to a building shortly before a fire had the opportunity to set the fire, and if opportunity and motive combine and all accidental causes are eliminated, fraud by arson or arson for profit can be proved. For example, in Fitzgerald v. Great Central Insurance Company, a Sixth Circuit decision from 1988 found that following a fire, plaintiffs' claim for benefits were denied. The insurers claimed that Gerald Fitzgerald set or procured the setting of the fire. Plaintiffs then filed a complaint against Aetna and Great Central for breach of contract. However, on the night of the fire, Gerald Fitzgerald, his son, and the family dog who lived in the apartment above the tavern where the fire occurred were all absent from the building. Gerald Fitzgerald spent the night at the Coho Club in Traverse City and left his son and dog with a friend. Michael Husby, who also lived in Fitzgerald's apartment and had recently bought into the corporation, visited the bar during the evening but spent the rest of the night at his girlfriend's house. The bar closed at 10.30 that night. Nothing unusual was noted in or around the building until flames and smoke were spotted at 1.30 a.m. The doors to the bar were locked, but the separate entrance to the upstairs apartment was unlocked. There was no sign of breaking or entering. Testimony at trial regarding why the insurer denied the insurance claim met the standard for relevancy. The insurer testified that it was the insurer's belief that the insured's plan to defraud the insurer from the beginning when they first acquired their homeowner's insurance policy, even though they were not living at the property. This was significant because a requirement for a valid homeowner's insurance policy is that the homeowner occupy the premises and was part of the insurer's arson-for-profit defense. The case was called Banks-Williams v. Allstate Vehicle and Property Insurance Company, a Sixth Circuit decision from 2019. Adjusters and SIU investigators may also find that they are involved in a staged theft where a fake residential theft is reported by the insured of property from a residence or business when none actually occurred. For example, in U.S. v. TAM, three defendants were convicted of conspiracy to commit mail fraud and to transport stolen cars in foreign com commerce, mail fraud, and transporting stolen cars in mm. foreign co commerce, and two of them were also convicted of conspiracy to launder money following a jury trial. The appellate court concluded evidence was sufficient to support one defendant's convictions. Considering the fact that plaintiff was arrested and cited for making a false insurance claim, and that the individual he identified in a photo lineup as having stolen his car later testified to the police he had been approached by a woman with connections to plaintiff who paid him $200 for participating in the staged theft of plaintiff's vehicle. The denial of the claim was found to be appropriate. 
In New Hampshire, a defendant participated in the stage theft of his wife's jewelry at a Brockton, Massachusetts restaurant in order to fraudulently collect $1,500 in insurance proceeds. Joseph Butler, an off-duty police officer dining at the restaurant, observed the activities of the defendant, his wife, his daughter, and a friend surrounding the staged theft, and his evidence was sufficient to affirm their conviction in a case called State v. Matiosis, a 1991 decision of the New Hampshire Supreme Court. Then there are stage water damage or mold claims, where the insured intentionally promotes damage by wetting down the residence or business property with a hose or disconnecting a plumbing fixture to generate water damage and encourage mold growth. A stage loss, regardless of the type, is fraud. Even if no claim is filed, an insured can be accused of attempted fraud and face criminal penalties. For example, in a New York case, a man gave his keys to a third party who was to sell or otherwise dispose of the car. The insured was told by the third party to file a fraudulent claim against his own policy and claim that the car was stolen. After reporting the theft, the insured became frightened and did not move forward with the claim. Regardless, the insured was re arrested and the court found him guilty of insurance fraud because he took active steps to commit the fraud. The insured could not avoid criminal liability by failing to fulfill every requirement of a false claim, and his conviction was for attempted insurance fraud. The most famous stage mold claim occurred in Texas in 2002. The seven conspirators were arrested by federal investigators working in conjunction with the Texas Department of Insurance. The defendants were charged with presenting insurance claims for water and mold damage to a succession of homes that they purchased, bought policies for, and then intentionally flooded the houses with water hoses or by damaging water pipes. At least one house was cooked. Heat was turned on to speed up the mold growth. Other members of the ring, posing as vendors and contractors, filed false claims to repair the damage and sold the homes to each other to repeat the process. Six of the conspirators were found guilty. The remaining conspirator, Ramanath Ramcharan, was found guilty by a federal jury for conspiracy, four counts of mail fraud, and ten counts of money laundering. As insureds and public adjusters become more mold-savvy, the temptation to create a covered law scenario where none would otherwise exist became almost irresistible, and until insurance policies were changed, the fraud succeeded. This article was adapted from my book, The Compact Book of, of Adjusting Property Claims, 3rd Edition, which is available at Amazon.com as both a Kindle book or a paperback. This video was adapted from the blog and is available free to anyone who clicks on the URL zelma.com slash blog. It's also available free as a video at rumble.com and at youtube.com where you can subscribe. The blog is posted usually five days a week, sometimes six. And if you found this blog posting or the videos to be of interest or useful to you, please tell your friends and colleagues so that they can also subscribe. Thank you for your attention.